Welcome to September's Tech of the Month, and to be honest, we really need to get to the bottom of why e-bikes keep catching fire. We've also got some of the weirdest new shoes in cycling, and of course, we've got our choice for Bike of the Month. First off though, let's get into those e-bike fires, Joe, because I recently saw a video on Instagram which made me pretty aware of the risks, and it did make me wonder why these fires have been happening. I've got to say, it was a pretty scary thing to see, and I guess if you're a prospective buyer of an e-bike or you're a current owner of an e-bike, that's gonna you know, set some alarm bells ringing. So um, I guess the question is, why is it happening and what can the industry do to change and adapt to this clearly pretty prevalent problem? Yeah, so firstly the why. Now, both e-bikes and e-scooters, any sort of that form of e-micro mobility, are powered by multi-cell lithium-ion battery packs. Now, these can suffer from something called thermal runaway. Now, essentially, thermal runaway happens when a cell overheats, maybe through a short circuit or sort of misuse of the batteries, maybe they're being charged at too high voltage, and what it causes is an exothermic reaction that breaks down that cell structure. In a tiny, you know, a single cell, that might not be too dangerous. The problem is, is there's so many of these cells if that reaction breaks into neighboring cells, very quickly, this breakdown can kind of turn into a rapid irreversible runaway that's characterized by fire, explosions, exactly the kind of things that we've seen in the videos. Um, and yeah, caused by the escape of highly flammable gases. So clearly not safe at all, but it's really important we reassure people that this is not every e-bike you see, particularly in say a bike shop, quite the opposite. But it's important to note too that change is on the way. So some of the UK's biggest organizations have joined forces to create an initiative which aims to educate the public on sort of the dangers around buying e-bikes or particularly as we'll come on to conversion kits um, and the short answer really is to buy from reputable manufacturers but it's not quite that simple okay so i think there's i mean there's a lot to unpack there i think who are the brands that are kind of making this change? Who's pushing this forwards? So Cycling UK, the Bicycle Association, yeah. the Association of Cycle Traders and Bosch e-bike systems are part of the Electric Bike Alliance. Um, so they launched this initiative last week, um, e-bike positive, and it hopes to inform people of the benefits of e-bikes as well as promoting knowledge around buying e-bikes and batteries properly. Right, okay. Well, I think I wanna come back to one of your earlier points, which was around this difference between kind of conversion kits um, and buying bikes from kind of reputable sources and bike shops. What's the kind of really important key takeaway for people to um, bear in mind when thinking about purchasing an e-bike? Sure, so I think what, what, what's really important and the main difference you're gonna see between those sort of like reputable brands, something let's say a Bosch Performance Line CX system or a Shimano system and whatever you might find on Amazon, quite typically, or the, the sort of very cheap conversion kits, is the battery technology. Now, a lot of these brands are going above and beyond the, quite frankly, pretty poor minimum requirements for e-bike batteries, including technology which basically isolates these cells. So in the event of a short circuit or something beginning to overheat, um, cells are isolated, switched off, and that can basically avoid this chain reaction. It's a great point, and Specialized, they actually develop their e-bikes out in Switzerland, and their product experience director said that there are a number of safety standards in place for complete e-bikes. However, we've chosen to go beyond current legal requirements by voluntarily complying with more, and then they go on to list a whole bunch of other standards. Um, and those go for the motor, the battery, and the charger, so the whole system. Um, and I think that's how these kind of reputable brands are able to ensure a higher level of safety um, is by kind of looking after the entire system um, and knowing that everything speaks to each other. Because if you were to try and plug in a third party charger to say a specialized system, the battery control module just wouldn't have it. It would just, it wouldn't accept it. So um, it's those kind of safety procedures that they go to that um, mean that, albeit more expensive systems, aren't gonna set fire to your house, which is a good thing. And I mean, this is a real problem because yeah, I, I mean, say, I think you've got yeah, some stats. Yeah, quite frankly, it's a good job brands are going above and beyond. This is information from Charlie Pugsley, Assistant Commissioner for Fire and Safety at the London Fire Brigade. And I think this puts it into perspective. He said that last year in London alone, there were 155 e-bike and e-scooter battery fires, making it the biggest growing fire trend in the UK. This is for stats in 2023. And sadly, these also took three lives and injured more than 60. Yeah. Um, the other thing to note as well is some transport companies in London 
actually totally disallow e-scooters, for example, from being on their trains, which basically shows they're not willing to insure against it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's that's why we're talking about it because it is a it's a new and growing problem. And as the market does get flooded with um, kind of potentially not as safe systems, um, I think it's just important that everyone looks after themselves um, and make sure you know they're aware of what they're buying um, because really no one should get hurt or killed because of their bike. 100%. And I think the other thing to note there is it's great that brands are going above and beyond. This initiative is fantastic. But really, is there a call for more legislation to be put in place? Because quite frankly, maybe there needs to be some sort of tightening of sort of trading standards in order to make this a, a safer sector. Because quite frankly, as much as you know, we can, we can write about it, we can talk about it, and that all raises awareness, and that's brilliant. But there's still a lot of people that will see, you know, a, a 400 pound e-bike and think brilliant. Uh, and, you know, if there's safety implications from that for a consumer, that's just not fair. Now, away from e-bikes, we have recently seen a spate of weird, weird cycling shoes hit the market, which, to be honest, they've all of them have left me scratching my head. Um, I saw that Pedled have come out with some folding bike packing shoes. Chapter 3 have come out with some cool SBD trainer style shoes, kind of to rival those of the Adidas Velo Sambas. Um, you recently spotted some Birkenstocks with um, an SBD attachment, um, and Physique have come out with some shoes that look like they would be more at home on the Sunday Run Club in London somewhere, as you can see. Now, I do wonder if we're starting to get into a world where traditional cycling shoes aren't really what people want anymore. Um, and to be honest, for the majority and for the masses who either commute or see cycling more as a kind of a utility, um, to me, it actually makes a lot of sense. Um, it does make me wonder why we haven't seen um, as much activity in this space um, previously and why now we're starting to see a lot more of these kind of weird and wacky designs. Um, yeah, there's, there's been quite a few, isn't there? I mean, obviously yeah. these, but the Pass Normal collaboration with Physique as well was yep. pretty, well, looked like moon shoes really, didn't it? With they the, really that did. very, very, um, yeah, bold silver design. Trek more recently as well had that sort of black and gold shoe that they released yeah. the Trek RSL. So it yeah. just feels like there's a lot more happening in the shoe space compared to what, hap what, what there was previously. I mean, yeah. even if we take these, because the brands are cashing in because these shoes here, um, they're 180 quid. They're not cheap, um, and as you can see from the sole there, they are pretty, pretty punchy. Um, but yeah, they're made to be a lot more comfortable. Um, they are still pretty stiff. Um, they have laces, again, for that comfort. Um, this isn't the only colorway. They do have two other colorways, a plain black and then a kind of uh, like an olivey um, green-ish. Um, now, I don't think you'd want to keep these ones on all day um, because they are, they're not super grippy on the bottom. No. Um, it's kind of a grippy material, but there's no tread. Yeah. Um, I don't F think funnily enough, it almost seems like the tread is underneath. The yes. <laughs> yeah, it looks like <laughs> it, doesn't it? So, yeah. yeah. Um, but still, I guess a recessed cleat does make things a lot easier, particularly, yeah, if you're going to be someone that's um, if, like stopping or if you're doing more gravel riding where you're going to be getting off, opening gates, that sort of thing. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's useful, but... Yeah, definitely. I think it's a bold with, look. <laughs> yeah, with these ones, um, I don't think these were ever made to be ones that you would wear all day. These are very much for on the bike. Um, but yeah, just an interesting, interesting setup. Um, and then some of the other shoes that I mentioned, the Pedaled Odyssey shoes, um, those ones have really got me confused. Yes, they are... Um interesting to say the least um, and I think it's worth starting by just outlining what these are actually designed for these are not made to be SPD compatible um, they are kind of pretty much for bike packers right so this is you've done your days riding you've fed up your bike shoes you've set up your camp um, you want to you know let your feet breathe have something a little bit more comfortable so obviously they need to be lightweight and small yeah um, so <laughs> <laughs> but no, they're not cycling shoes. No. Um, which is fine. Although, what they are there for is incredibly expensive camping slippers. Yeah, they, they really are. They are £115. Yes, they're light. Yes, they pack down small. But just buy some sliders off 
Amazon for £10? Well, exactly. So one of the big features of these is that they can fold um, and be really compact. But you made a really good point earlier, actually, which is that usually you don't put your shoes inside your bike packing bags. You yeah. usually just strap them to the outside. Abs yeah, absolutely. Whether it, whether it's hiking or bike packing, personally, I've always found that, you know, if, if you're hiking your approach shoes, for example, you just like they're the last thing that you strap to the outside of your bag. So maybe they need to be light. But actually, the fact that they pack down, I feel like most people are just going to, I don't think it's, it's not definitely, it's certainly not essential, I would say. Well, yeah, certainly. And I think you made another really good point. If you did want something that packed down and did go into your bags, just buy some camping slippers for a tenner. Like, yeah. you don't need the, to spend a lot of money. This, this is, I think, the, and, the, and this is where I think potentially you find, find the problem with the pedal head shoes. The, as you say, the direct, the direct rivals to these would be like a camping slipper. Now, brands like Xbed or Rab make similar shoes in a lot of cases which are insulated which actually unless it's really really warm it's actually quite nice mm -hmm. um particularly for like you know the kind of camping we have in the uk yeah. and even from you know very sort of generally quite expensive camping brands you're looking at 30 to 45 pounds which just makes these look a little bit yeah yeah moving on though um there are the adidas velo sambas now these aren't new um, but Joe, I think yes. you have some with you. I do have, yes. And you're going to have to forgive me because these have done rather a lot of mileage. Um, but these, we've, we've, we've brought these on really to give context to our next shoes. Yes. This shoe basically used the Samba as a base. There's a sort of plastic insole plate to which the cleat is fixed. Um, they're great. They're obviously very popular. Yeah. Um, I have managed to use them just as normal shoes as well. The problem is... As you can see, they're really quite stiff. Mm. Now, for riding, that's great, mm. absolutely fine. Um, but for walking, it's mm. not really. They're, they're, for me, they're just about an everyday shoe, but it's not. It's not particularly comfortable. Yeah. Um, and the other thing as well is that actually, because the recess is quite low, you, you do you do sometimes you sound a little bit like a tap dancer if you're walking around. Yeah. Um, which is to bear in mind as well. But nonetheless, I think iconic. But the reason why those provide context for us is because chapter three has come out with a new shoe called the Transit Shoe. Um, and I would say these are the closest rivals to the Sambas. Yes. But it feels like they haven't been retrofitted to have SPDs. These have been designed ground up to incorporate them. And actually, I think they look good. I think these are really smart. Yes, I've, I've been um, very impressed with these. So as Sam says, they are the culmination of about two years of development, specifically with the goal of creating a shoe that can be worn every day, walked in, ran in, whatever, and used to clip into you know your, your commuting bike, or in my case, I ride a Fixie quite often as well. Um, and yeah, I've been very impressed with them. They somewhat resemble, I think, kind of similar to like a Nike Air Force One, which is, yeah. I would say, no bad thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, super, super comfortable to walk in. So the underside of these shoes, currently I've got them set up just, like, just as, a, as a flat shoe. So they come with like a bottom plate. The recess, there's plenty of room for um, an SBD pedal. But the biggest thing compared to the Sambas is the amount of flex you get. So that just actually makes this a genuine all day shoe. Like yeah. I, I've, I've, I've worn these as just normal shoes today and I don't think twice about it, which I think actually for, for like a commuter or something like that is, is genuinely really, really useful. Yeah, definitely. I think if you wanted a kind of a stylish pair of shoes to wear around the office, um, I think they work really well. Question though, Joe, how much are they gonna cost? Yes, they're not the cheapest things in the world. So £195 or $235. That is quite um, a lot, especially in comparison to the Velo Sambas. It is, uh, yeah, 100%. The other thing you have to remember though is that because they are quite a good looking shoe, um, in the fashion world, £200 for a pair of shoes is certainly not cheap, but I don't think it's crazy. Um, that said, I think £200 may put quite a few people off. I wouldn't be, it, to be honest, it would put me off, but um, I fully respect what's been created and they do look really nice. Um, and yeah, if you did want something that did, you know, best of both worlds, they do kind of make sense. Yeah, 100%. For this month's Bike of the Month, uh, we have the Genesis Croix de Fur. Now, a few weeks back, you were in Wales in the UK and you were riding said new Genesis Croix de Fur. Tell us all about it. 
yeah, so first things first, it's a really good bike. I've really, really enjoyed it actually. Um, a little bit different to the bikes I'd normally ride. So it's a steel frame bike, loads of different builds available for the new Croix de Fer. But it really is one of the early gravel bikes really. Uh, it's been around since I think 2009, 2007, 2009. Um, and yeah, received its first update in around four years. Um, but what's changed? So the first and most obvious thing is sort of cable routing is now internal. Um, now, previously it was always like totally external cable routing, which is great for mechanics, but okay, in modern day doesn't maybe that doesn't fit the aesthetic. What I do like though is they haven't got nuts, so it's just the down tube which is now internal, and you still get an outer cable that is run the entire way through the frame. Next up is tie clearance, so that's up now to 47 millimeters claimed, though Madison did let on that you can probably squeeze a 50 mil tire in there, oh, okay. tire dependent. Yeah. Um, the other thing as well is that a 45 mil tire will fit with full length mud guards, which I think is nice. also good to know, so you're still gonna have some mud clearance there as well. Um, with the bigger tires comes something which I think is very nerdy, but actually quite interesting. They've actually also had to adjust the geometry. Now, reach across all the different frame sizes is quite similar. Mm. Most of the sort of ergonomic changes are now handled by sort of stem length, for example, or saddle setback. The reason for that is because there's actually an ISO standard for toe overlap. As tires get bigger, the tire, the sort of leading edge of the tire is pushed further and further towards where your toe overlaps with the tire. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they've actually sort of had to change that to sort of fit in line with the bigger tires that we're so used to seeing these days. A couple of other things as well, drop seat stays. Um, this is partly to aid in the sort of comfort department, but also to, again, modernizing the bike in terms of aesthetics as well. There's also an overlies top tube, which is said to improve, um, improve stiffness, but also comfort as well. And finally, there is an absolute plethora of different build options. Ah. So four frame sets have been released. There's a chromoly steel build, a 725 steel build, a 931 stainless steel build, which looks absolutely fantastic. And to top things off, there is a titanium build as well. So in terms of full builds, you can only currently get the uh, chromoly steel frame. But as I said, you can get all those frame sets um, as sort of frame only builds, so you can do your own custom builds. Sure. I mean, that sounds great. It sounds like they've really pulled the Croix de Fer right bang up to date with what people are gonna want. Question is though, how does it actually ride? Yeah. So. We did uh, like a pretty long four hour ride, I think it ended up being in the Haverhill Forest in Wales, which amazing, amazing gravel riding, probably some of the better riding we've got in the UK for that sort of terrain. Um, lots of fire roads, some more technical single track as well. And the bike performed really, really well. I thought it was very comfortable. Um, of course, it's not the lightest bike in the world. It's not gonna rival a carbon frame, um, but it, yeah, it just felt really, really solid, comfortable and like I could just, happily ride it all day. Um, I'd say the geometry is probably slightly more aggressive um, than sort of like a race gravel bike or you know the bikes that sit closer to like cross geometry um, but still not crazy but overall I say comfortable, great fun uh, and just yeah sort of track to light ride for. I just felt like I could ride anything on it which was really cool. So that's all really good to hear um, but I guess my question would be is how much is it going to cost? Okay, yes, so I think what I'll do is I'll start with one of the full build options. Now, a good option for sort of comparison to other things on the market is the uh, Genesis Croix de Fer 20. So that is two by 10 GRX, cable pull um, TRP disc brakes, and that is gonna cost you 16.99 with the steel frame. So not the cheapest, has to be said. The other frames, as I said, frame set only options, are again, not cheap as well, but they are sort of much more premium. So the 931 stainless steel frame set, uh, you're looking at 2,499 pounds, and the titanium frame set is 2,699. One other thing to note as well is that Genesis is committed to working with their local dealers. Now, that's something for me, I think is actually really important. So that means you won't be able to go and get this bike direct to consumer, which, okay, maybe that is partly why the price is gonna be a little bit higher, but by going through one of their dealers that they have that relationship built with, and then you as a customer, also build that relationship. There's something really special about that. Shops, every shop that I've ever worked for, like you look after your customers. And I think there's, yeah, there's a lot to be said to that if you start having problems with your bike, knowing that the warranty is gonna be taken care of by your local bike shop, rather than having to deal with a chatbot online. Yeah. I think there's, there's, there's definitely something to be said for that as well. Absolutely. Well, 
Let us know what do you think of the brand new Genesis Croix de Fer.